I want to tell you about a faith far less populated than any of the more famous religions. If you ever even heard of this one, I'd be very surprised. I discovered Ekinkar through a fellow who was my very best friend for almost 35 years. Bruce Fuller had been raised Lutheran, but shortly after moving to New York from Iowa, as he was cultivating his relationship with the woman who would become his first wife, I seem to remember they were married in a Presbyterian ceremony, and I sang at the wedding. Well, I'm now jumping to the time when he was getting married for the fourth time. Every one of these ladies, excepting the first, were also initiates in Ekinkar. I put the following down as part of an attempt to save my second marriage. I had suffered through one divorce, and I had sworn to myself that I would never go through another. Allison and I had brought Jordan into the world and had raised her to the age of emancipation. Jordan was about to graduate from college and had met the man of her dreams. You can see about this in my video called Innocence. I want you to know that I would have done anything I could to hold my family together. About a year before Allison and I separated for good, I tried to explain to her and our therapist the why of how I found it necessary to detach myself from a man I had loved from my earliest days in New York. So this is what I told Allison and Marion. I've just discovered what is at the heart of Ekinkar, and it frightens me to the point that I no longer wish to trust Bruce or Emma as our friends. I have been made aware that I was damaged by my upbringing in the Catholic Church, but with my writing and with you and with the friends that I am seeing clearer, I am confident I'm going to be all right. Bruce and Emma? I'm not so sure. It appears that Ekinkar offered them reason, reason behind the damage that was done to them, reason for the damage that was done to them. Ekinkar showed them reason where they had not been able to find reason, but when they were hurt, there was no reason. There was just the hurt. There can be no reason for a father to abuse his own child. That type of action speaks of an absence of reason. It is my understanding that Ekinkar explained to them that there was no avoiding the pain that they had suffered. It was a karmic lesson that they had to learn in this life on earth. They were paying a karmic debt because of some evil that they had committed in a previous life. But they could if they committed themselves to Ekinkar, they could take steps in this life that would allow them to avoid any more pain or suffering in the next or the next. If they sang to bring themselves in tune with the universe and thus develop their own spiritual gianthood connecting on the inner, they could do service in this life and, in a way, pay forward fulfilling any karmic debt that they still had remaining. Bruce and Emma would use their third eye, their inner vision, to communicate with Sri Harold and several other higher Eck initiates, and through them would learn of the services that they might perform in this life as a means of paying forward. Now, there are initiation rites by which Eckists step-by-step step climb the strata of this spiritual ladder. There is a beginner level, and then the initiate levels are numbered. I don't know how high the numbers go, but Bruce once told me the strangest insider joke. He said the only way one could be certain of achieving a sixth level status would be to achieve an eighth level initiation and talk about it. Bruce laughed and laughed. This is what frightens me. Bruce hasn't spoken of his initiate level for quite some time now, not since he and Emma were married, at least. Last spring, when I told Bruce that I thought Harold Klemp, the living Eckmaster, was selling snake oil, Bruce went very cold. I knew I'd struck a nerve, so I backed off. 
And I guess that Bruce wrote off my rudeness as an unfortunate side effect of my lack of inner vision. How could I possibly assess Harold's intentions without having communed with Harold on the inner? Fast forward to last week. What follows is a brief lampoon that I wrote in an email to Bruce. Another attempt at telling my best friend something that I believe he was trying very hard not to hear. Keep your eyes on the prize. Don't look over here at what's right in front of your face. God wants you to look past that. Use your superhuman x-ray vision. Yes, that was in the starter pack that God gave you. Use your inner eye to see what no one else can see. Yes, they too have inner eyes, but most of them have lost touch with them. But God blessed us with a twitchel to help us get back in touch with our inner eyes. God spoke to Twitchell directly. God spoke to Twitchell, his only begotten Eck, and told him the magic word so that the Twitchell could tell the world of this clear pathway to the prize. And thou shalt not listen to anyone who would mock the Twitchell. I say unto you, he who would mock the Twitchell is a dick and is unworthy of your exceptional vision. Shun him. He can only serve to distract you from the prize. Bruce's email response. All in all, I prefer the one about the young man from Kent. I suppose it was written to mock and get an emotional reaction. Sorry to disappoint. It is neither witty, insightful, thought-provoking, nor uplifting. To give it any further attention doesn't seem fruitful. My day goes on. B. This response stung me. I too prefer the one about the man from Kent, but it was that bit about further attention not seeming fruitful that hurt. Only days later, September 30, it was Bruce's birthday. What to do? I had recently written a short little thought that I liked quite a lot. I titled it For Bruce and sent it on its way, with wishes for a happy day. For Bruce, by Joseph Kalinske. I was born into a religious household. With the very best of intentions, I was steeped like tea in the traditions of Catholicism, as if this were the one and only path to everlasting happiness in heaven. As a small child, I was already given the misguided notion that I should look right past the wonders that I saw before me, look past this life to the glory that awaited me in the next, look past the sinful momentary pleasures that I found before me here and now. Be a better person and say my prayers. Whenever anyone died, it was stated not as belief but as fact that they were in a better place. Didn't look like a better place to me. It appeared to me that they were just dead. This is the better place. Here, with me. Bruce's email responds to this gentler attempt. That's beautiful, Joey, full of love and meaning. I shall treasure it always. Thanks for the weather. It's truly appreciated. I love you too, Bruce. I found it significant that he had spelled out his first name in its entirety. The earlier abbreviated sign off read to me as disgruntled. And that bit about the weather, hell, I'll just tell you what I've written above this attempt. Happy birthday, Brucey. You are extremely important to me. I hope you're okay. I ordered up the most beautiful weather I could find. It reminded me of Tarzan Boy in the Splash Pool. I hope you have that much fun with it. Please, view the attachment as a true gift, meaning it is yours to do with as you please. You can even throw it away unopened if you like. I love you, Joey. I'm not going to explain about Tarzan Boy in the Splash Pool. It's too complicated. I'm sure you get the picture. To say that I was taken aback by Bruce's critique of keep your eyes on the prize would be a gross understatement. I'd had no preconceived ideas about how he would respond. 
Expect the unexpected and you will always get your wish. In closing, uh, for this chapter, shortly after the events here described, I called Bruce and told him that I could no longer carry on my friendship with him. The fortress he had constructed for himself in the body of Ekenkar was too forbidding for me to enter any longer. I hope you'll have a wonderful day today. And I hope you'll leave a comment and, and tell me what you think. And tell your friends. Ciao for now. C'est fini. <laughs>